We are in Genesis chapter 6. This is lesson 9 in this series. This is one of those days where just about everything in this lesson is just fun facts. I mean, really it is. It's fun facts. You're not going to get saved over this. Your heart's not going to be convicted in, in this week's lesson. Although I am going to point out some very important things that are theological seeds that are planted in this lesson, just as we've had lots of seeds planted already that are developed through the rest of the Bible to be major theological themes. And I'm talking about major. The major theological themes throughout the entire Bible, there are ten of them. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Man, angels, sin, salvation, the Bible, the church, and last things, end times. That's the ten major themes in the Bible. Every other theme that you can pull out is a really a sub-theme of one of those themes. Grace is a sub-theme of salvation. Okay, Eternal life is a sub-theme of salvation. Everything fits under those ten themes. Those are the major things that you need to know about. And if you know those themes, every time you hear someone pull something up that is a, a lower part of that theme, you can sew it in where it belongs because you've got the correct picture. Now, you have heard me also say, for those of you who went through the study we did called um, Beginning Your Life as a New Disciple, those are the themes we studied. And in that, you will remember that every one of those themes I showed you in those booklets, an example from Genesis chapter 1 through Genesis chapter 11, because the Lord lays out what's going to be filled out and uh, and flushed out, or as uh, Wade would say, unpacked, all the way through the rest of the book of Revelation. It's unpacked, it's added to, it's developed But the themes are put in place in Genesis chapter 1 through Genesis chapter 11. Well, as we ended last week's lesson, the Lord has laid out for us the genealogy of Adam through a godly line that takes us down to Noah. Actually, the chart I had on the board last week took us down through Noah's sons, Japheth, uh, Shem, and Ham. This week, I just brought you in, and I stripped it down some, took some of the the details off of it so we could just see a few major things that we need. This is the godly line. But if you remember, as we went through the godly line of of Adam was um, 130 years old when he uh, had the son by the name of Seth, and then lived so many more years later, longer, and he died at, at 930 years old. And then Seth was 105 when he had Enosh, and then he lived more years, and he died when he was, uh, he died in the year 1042 after the creation of Adam. Now, I want you to catch this. These charts I'm putting to you, for instance, you see way over there, it says Noah died in 1998. That was not 1998 just a few years ago. That was 1998 years after the creation of Adam. Remember, we're laying the years out going forward. Now, when we get to the end of this study, we go through chapter 50 of the book of Genesis. Believe me, I'm going to then show you some other things that tell us years. And what we will do is we will reverse this timeline and put the year dates going backwards. But just for right now, we're starting with Adam's creation and we're moving forward in the number of years. So do not be mistaken about this. That's not 1998. 18 years ago, this is 1998 years after the creation of Adam. The flood occurs 1,650 years after the creation of Adam. How do we know that? Because the Lord gave us this genealogy. And in next week's lesson, chapter 1, I mean chapter 7, next week's lesson, we find out that Noah, I'm telling you this ahead of time because you'll want to come back, Noah enters the ark and all the animals entered the ark when Noah was 600 years, two months, and 17 days old. You follow me? We know that, okay? Well, 
We also know that he was 500 years old when he began to have sons. And his first son was Japheth, who was born when he was 500 years old. In last week's lesson, we learned that Sham uh, is born when, he, uh, when he's 502. And then we don't know when Ham was born. We have no clue anywhere in the scripture to tell us how old Ham was. But we know he's younger than Sham, who is younger than Japheth. All right. Now. Um, what's going on with the scripture? So we pick up here and we have this genealogy. Oh, I need to add one thing. We also had over here on this side of the board, if you remember, we had the genealogy of Cain. All the way down through Lamech to Jubal. It's not on the board, it was on last week's. It was a Jubal, a Jabal, Jubal, and Tubla Cain. And they were the sons of Lamech, who was the seventh in the line, or the sixth in the line from Cain. These sons were important because they had developed some major, major uh, in, inventions and, in, uh, and ways of doing things. Uh, Jabal had invented uh, tents so that the people could live in tents more than just caves. And that is on down towards the end, going towards the flood. He had also invented, the not invented, but gathered and started gathering herds of animals that he would call his own, his own livestock, because they were just running free, and he would herd them like a shepherd, okay? Now, he, he's the one that's accredited for bringing that into being. So all these families are beginning to herd animals because of this son of Jabal. Jabal's second son, Jubal, who uh, of, the, of one of his wives uh, invented the harp, the lyre that we have, uh, the thoughts of, of like a guitar on, on a circle or whatever, you know, strings, and also the uh, playing music through uh, a piece of pipe or a piece of cane or something, uh, like a, a recorder or whatever, um, or maybe pipes at different lengths put together where you could blow them. Uh, he's the one who's accredited with that. And then from Lamech's second wife, uh, is Tublacain, who is the uh, father of, who discovered how and taught people how to make bronze and iron tools for cutting, for hammering, and all that type of stuff. And so they are very important people, and they, in fact, are very infamous. They are so important that, that their names are written down in our book, the Bible, so that we will know that these things were created even on the evil side, the Cain side of Adam's kids. Uh, how evil were they? Well, Cain was evil. He killed, he killed uh, his brother Abel, and yet the Lord protected him. The Lord took care of him, made sure no one could kill him, but he just had to struggle. There's a penalty for what he did. And then there was also some other blessings. And one of the blessings was he had three kids, uh, great, great, great grandkids down the line in the seventh generation from him that were noted for things they invented. Well, we put those two lines together. We understand that there was the tree of life, if you remember, and Adam was barred from the tree of life, so he had to move east of the tree of life, and he formed his family camp there. Uh, when Cain killed Abel, one of the penalty things was he, was he had to move east of Adam's family. So we have Adam's family who are camping, and then east of them we have Cain's family of, who are camping, and they are beginning to grow in number and multiply on the earth. Chapter 6, verse 1. It says, and now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, get this, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Mm. Well, I want to give you just a little indication here, a little thought. And we ask the question, it's in the first paragraph, I'll just, I'll paraphrase it here for you. How many people could have been born between the creation of Adam and the deluge of the flood? How many people? So we know that over in Cain's line, there were seven generations. We know in Adam's line, there's ten generations. And if you remember from the description of for all of them is after they named one of the persons in the line, a son, the scripture went on to say, and they had other sons and daughters. 
So how many other sons and daughters did they have? We do not know. Anything we might put forth is just a guess. We have no idea. However, I want to help you with what could be the magnitude of this with a guess. I do want to show you a guess. It's just that. It is just a guess. Uh, the guess goes like this. And it's in, I've got it explained here in the first paragraph, but listen to me on this. If, if, if Adam and Eve had four boys and four girls who lived, eventually they made it up and paired up into pairs. And if Cain had four boys and four girls, and every one of those boys and girls paired up and had four boys and four girls on average. This morning I said, you know, that's four and four, that's eight. And I had Steve Jones sitting right here, and he just laughed at me. He said, eight kids, that's nothing. We got ten. <laughs> How many did Jacob have? Twelve. How many did Esau have? Twelve. How many did Ishmael, Ishmael have? Twelve. So guess what? Pretty even number in the Bible tends to be twelve, okay? I'm not saying twelve. I'm just saying eight that actually lived and made it into adulthood and paired up with a sister or a cousin or whatever. How many couples... Could we have? Now, I'm talking about couples here. I'm not talking about individuals. I'm talking about couples. I just want to show it to you. Okay. So here we got an example. In this line, let's say Adam and Eve are the very first couple. And they have eight kids, four boys and four girls. So that's four couples. You got that? You follow me here? And we're going to go down ten generations from that. We've got four. Those four are going to have 16. The 16 by the next generation is going to have 64 the next generation is going to be 256. The fifth generation is 1,024 kiddos. That's a big family party already, isn't it? And they're living long enough to see them all. The sixth generation is 4,096. And the seventh generation is 16,384. So in Cain's line, in the seven generations of how many people they could have. This is just a guess. They could have had somewhere in the neighborhood of 16,384 couples. Couples. Double that number for people. You follow me? Okay, now, get this. Adam's line went ten generations, not seven. So from the seventh one, it goes to 65,536 to 262,144. And the next time those pairs have four kids who are male and four kids who are females, it is 1,048,576. I'm just guessing. I'm just showing you probability. Remember, that's pairs. That is not individuals. Double that for pairs. What does that mean? Even if you look at the chart and you say, okay, we get down to Noah's time. How many are alive at the flood? Well, I'll just a, a little more than half of them have died, um, of the oldest ones have died, but that still leaves a whole bunch at the flood. So we could say there's easily guessed there's anywhere from a half a million to possibly a million and a half people who are on this earth when it's time for the water, the rain to start flooding. Uh, it's not going to be billions. It's just not. It could be a few more by 500,000 more, or it could be a few less by whatever. Okay, we don't know. But it's a whole lot of people. And what we do know from last week's lesson is by the third generation, Enosh means mortal depravity which means the earth is full of mortal depravity by the third generation. The third generation. And then the rest of these names spell out a story of what's to come. That's in what last week's lesson. Names mean something in Hebrew. They tell us the story. In fact, we finally get down to the judgment of the Lord is coming or the ruling of the Lord is coming and we get down to Noah and Noah's, mean, Noah's name means rest is here. Rest. In other words, when the flood comes, all the depravity has come to an end and the depravity has come to a time of rest on the earth. Even though 
the earth is flooded. I wouldn't exactly say having a flooded earth and floating on an, an ark that's 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 70, 45 feet high with a whole bunch of stanky animals inside of it is exactly rest. But it was rest. It was peace, and it was rest. Well, we come down in the same passage, and you see this verbiage, the sons of God. I put it in bold so you could see where I was, uh, where I am there in that second passage, the uh, second paragraph on page 61. The sons of God, that is a reference to this godly line of Seth that comes down. But remember, in this godly line of Seth, Seth has more sons and more daughters besides what's in this line. And each one of these guys has more sons. Even Adam has more sons and more daughters. But this is the godly line that's coming down. The ungodly line is in that camp that is further east, which is, is Cain's camp. But what's going to happen is we see they're going to start, I mean, they're cousins, folks. They're going to start finding out, as we find right here, hey, there's some good-looking gals over in that other camp. This line, Adam's line, is looking at the sons, the daughters of over there in that other camp, and they like what they see, and they're going to begin taking wives from them. Okay, well, listen, there are many of you who have heard it said that the sons of God, you've mistakenly held that these sons of God are angels, and that these angels came down and had sexual relationships with these daughters. Okay? We've got a problem with that. We have a problem, and to answer that, we need to go to Jesus. By the way, Jesus is the right person for us to go to because Jesus is the one that created it all. He's the Lord, and He knows. When He was questioned by the Sadducees about <laughs> resurrection and having having married spouses and everything in heaven, here's how Jesus answers that in Matthew chapter 22, verse 30. He says, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. There's no marrying in heaven. There's no marriage in heaven. Okay, now I want you to understand I need to take you back. Just a moment. We have a concept of marriage that is actually off base. We think marriage is when you gather a bunch of friends together and the two of you stand in front of the altar and there is a minister there with all the crowd and you promise God that you're going to love that person and that person promises God that they're going to love this person and you promise each other you're going to love each person and the minister says, by the power invested in me by the state of Texas and the, and the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, I now have the privilege of pronouncing you husband and wife and you're married. <laughs> It's a, we think of it as the ceremony. It's not the ceremony in the Bible. Remember last week's lesson? To marry is the act of taking two flesh and becoming one flesh. Listen, go to the story of Isaac when he takes his wife. We're going to get there in just a few chapters. So you don't have to go there because we're going to get there. Do they stand up before a minister and have vows and everything? No. All they do is Isaac takes his bride and they go into the tent and they have a sexual relationship and they are married. Carrying that on out through, because it's in the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, we find that later on that anyone that you have had a sexual relationship with, in God's eyes, you have been now considered married to them because the parts have married together. That's the concept of marriage in the Scripture here in this passage and in the last passage and all the way through the Scripture. That's what marriage is. It has nothing to do with you standing before God. Somebody show me in the Bible where a marriage ceremony is there where they stand up and they ask uh, do you take this husband to be your wife? Do you take this wife to be your lawfully wedded uh, wife to love, cherish? You don't see that anywhere. In fact, what we do see in the scripture is the celebration that occurs, which the feast is after they have been married for seven days in their own chamber. They come out for a party. They know exactly when the date the party is because they've gone into the chamber seven days before. That's what marriage is. That's not the concept we have here. Well, 
Angels do not have that ability. All the angels that were ever created were created on the very first day when God created the heavens before He created the earth. You follow me? Okay, so on that, we see that going down. And what's interesting here, the sons of God are what are those who are the godly guys who are in the line. They should be godly. But now we've got a problem. Turn to page 62, the daughters of men. That is a reference to the female descendants of Cain. They're also called Cainites. Listen to me. They're called Cainites, not to be confused with Canaanites. Canaanites are going to be the descendants of a grandson of Noah after the flood. This is Canaanites. These are that line of seven uh, generations of people. They're Canaanites. And they've got good-looking girls being born. Now, remember last, last week we talked about, in fact, we've, fact, we've talked about it for two weeks now. Uh, in the scripture, when it says a male and a female, the word male in the Hebrew is ish. The word female is ish shah. S-H-A-S-H -H is the way we would spell it. S-H-A-H. -H. Um, the word shah means to gaze at. So ish means the male. Shah means gaze, male gaze. So uh, Adam cre is created, he's the ish, and when Eve is co created, what does he do? He, the male, gazes at her. So if women, if you do not like to be gazed at by men, you can talk to God about that. Because God's in charge of that and he made you to be gazed at. It is the same word that the Bible uses in the Hebrew to talk about the offerings of Cain and Abel. The Lord gazed at Cain's, I mean at Abel's offering, but he didn't even take a gander at Cain's offering, and that's what made him mad. Chapter 4, that's a great lesson. Go back and listen to it, and go back and catch it, and catch it on the web if you want to. It's a great lesson if you missed it. Uh, important stuff there. Important stuff for our theology that's going to develop all the way through the rest of the book of Revelation. Here, it is not the word, uh, uh, this word, this sea, they saw the daughters of men. It's not the word shah for gaze. It's the word ra'ah, R-A-A-H. It doesn't mean to gaze pleasantly at. It means to stare at. To stare at it. In other words, these sons of God, these God of the, the, the men who have the godly lineage, are staring at these women who are of these Cain, Cain's line, and they want them, and they're lusting after them, and they're, they, they're wanting what they're seeing, and they took wives of whomever they pleased. Now, this is interesting. It's not in your notes. It's my mistake. I thought I had put it in the notes, but it's not here. I have a feeling it's in a paragraph below these notes that I stuck down below. But there's another thought that's interesting that is here that you need to, we need to look at. Here it says, they took wives of whom they pleased. They took wives of whom they chose, in other words. There is a great mortal depravity, moral and mortal depravity, that is occurring at this point in time. It started back with Cain. It has been recognized with Enosh. In fact, the, in, during the days of Enosh, men began to, the word, scripture says, to call upon the name of the Lord. But actually, the word call there is the word that means to proclaim the name of the Lord. Why? Because there's so much depravity in the humanity that's going on. Uh, um, here, what happens is, uh, man was supposed to leave his father and mother, according to the last verses of chapter 1, and cleave to his wife, and the two become one flesh, and to marry and, and one flesh, and to go on, and to leave and to cleave. It was one man for one woman. That's what it was. But already in Cain's line, last week's lesson, we saw where they began to take more than one wife. This was a sin, to have more than one wife. In fact, if you remember, when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and to the Sadducees, they ask Him, Why is this and what is this deal about marrying and divorcing and having more than one wife? 
And Jesus says, it was not supposed to be that way from the beginning. You remember the passage? In other words, I believe here there's a kernel of thought that is going, there's a seed of theology that begins here in the first 11 chapters, here in chapter 6, about marriage, true marriage. Now, does that make any good, any difference throughout? No, because man is still going to continue to do it. In fact, even though in the New Testament we finally get to the point where the, where the, the leaders have one wife, one man, one wife, we have that. Uh, we have the instruction for the ministers to be husbands of one wife. We've got all that going on. It's coming back, it's coming around with the church age, with all the instruction into the church age. It starts with the book of Romans and goes all the way to the book of Jude. That's church instruction. We get it back on track, but prior to that, prior to that, man, we've got men taking multiple wives. And it's very difficult to prove that a husband should have just one wife when we look at the lives of David and Abraham, and, but Isaac only had one wife. We look at Jacob, he's got multiple. It's difficult to, to prove that point until we get to the end where we get the instructions to the church. Now look here. So these daughters, these sons of the godly line are, are truly, truly, truly gawking at these females in the ungodly line and they choose wives who they wish and however many they wish, and they begin to intermarry. So the family unit of Adam and the family unit of Cain begin to intermingle. And along with that, the idea of tools and livestock and everything else begin to merge together. Verse 3, 120 years remain. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. In this verse, the Lord is giving us a time. He's telling us a time. How do we know that? We know that because here it tells us it's going to be 120 more years. Follow me over the board. All right. Next week, lesson chapter 7, we're going to find out that they enter the ark when, when Noah is 600 years old, two months and 17 days. Right there. We know because of the genealogy that it's, that's going to happen in the year uh, 1,650 after the creation of Adam. Take 120 years backwards from that, we're in the year 1530. That's when this passage is being delivered to Noah. This is when the initial instruction is being given to Noah about what God thinks about what's going on on the earth and what he wants Noah to do. And he's choosing Noah because of the favor that he has for Noah. And the word favor is better translated grace. The grace that he has for Noah because of Noah's life. He didn't tell anyone else, he didn't tell anyone else but Noah. Nevertheless, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. That's all the time that is left on earth until the flood. Noah is 480 years old when that message comes to him. Chapter 7 is going to move us 120 years down the road. You see this? Chapter 7 picks up with, y'all go get in the ark. It's time. It's 120 years down the road. This tells us in the timing that it's 1,530 years after the creation of Adam. And Noah is 480 years old. Japheth is not going to be born for 20 more years. Shem is not going to be born for 22 more years. And we do not know how many years it will be until Ham is born. In other words, Noah is not going to have the help of these three boys for quite a while building the ark. Yes, sir. I saw a hand over here. Yes, sir. No, it has long, how long man is going to live on earth until the devastation is going to come. What's the devastation? He's fixing to explain it to us. Okay, but we're going to talk about Nephilim first. Verse 4. The, yes, ma'am. He was, Noah entered the ark when he was 600 years, 2 months, and 17 days old. And that's in chapter 7 next week. Okay. It says the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. You catch that? 
those days and after. When the sons of God became, came to the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were mighty men who were of old men of renown. Nephilim. What does the word Nephilim mean? Well, first of all, the, the association that goes with them is that these Nephilim were men of renown. These were men who were known men. We've got known men today. You can't go any, by, any place in the United States and mention Sagemont Church and they will not come back and say, your pastor is John Morgan. Anywhere in the United States. Pretty much anywhere in Africa or Europe too. This church has been so heard of. And John Morgan, he is a man of renown. He is not a Nephilim, but he is a man of renown. What is a Nephilim? A Nephilim, the Hebrew word means he fell. In other words, he's a sinner. He's a man who has fallen from the grace of the Lord, and not fallen from the grace of the Lord, but actually he's a fallen man. Let's use that terminology. Now the great Greek Septuagint translated this interesting. The Greek Septuagint translated that this is an earthborn man. Earthborn. In other words, this is not an angel. This is not a descendant of angels. This is a man of renown who is a, a worldly man, who is a a uh, carnal man in every way who can gather up the folks, who can conquer people, who can conquer things and battles for his own purposes, but not for the purposes of God. Not ever for the purposes of God because they are sinful men. Lamech was the seventh generation there from Cain. He's the one who had the kiddos who could do the, tool, the bronze tools, the iron tools, the musical instruments. And uh, the housing, the tents, and, and, um, uh, and uh, most likely uh, his kiddos, their kiddos, married in with Seth's line of kiddos from Adam. And all these, this stuff started going back and forth. And so we've got these people of renown. They know about Jubal. They know about uh, Jabal. They know about Tublacane. They know over here about all the descendants here that are mighty and powerful. Methuselah and, and all of that. And they're all intermarrying now. The, the lines of the family lines have blurred like, uh, like uh, we kind of think they should not have blurred. Well, the Nephilim, many of us have been told that the Nephilim were the giants. Because they were descendants of angels. They were not giants. They were men of renown. They were men who were well known. They were fallen, sinning men uh, who did not look to God for anything. Because remember, the depravity is going on at this point in time in such great, uh, uh, across all the people. Uh, the Hebrew word here is the word rapha, uh, R-A-P-H-A-H. Now, that word... Um, that word means um, giant. I'm sorry, I told you just wrong. If, if we're talking about Goliath, because we often think about Goliath, because he was 10, foot and a half, 10 and a half feet tall, and we think about him being a giant, a giant man in stature. That is the, that is the word Rapha, R-A-P-H-A-H. That's not the word being used here. The word being used here is Nephilim, which means that's the Hebrew word the way we would say Nephilim, that's the Hebrew word, in fact. That means a person of high esteem. But he's an earthly man, a carnal man of high esteem. Uh, uh, Noah is a man of high esteem, but he's not a Nephilim because he's a godly man. Cain is a Nephilim in many ways because he's a person of high esteem, but he's a sinner, not saved, not redeemed. Okay. So these heroes could conquer, heroes of the people could conquer for different reasons, but not for godly reasons. The, the Nephilim were earthborn. Look at this, the last paragraph of your notes on page 63. Here's the example that you'll catch some of this if, because I'm using some of the terminology from the New Testament and from some of the parts of the Old Testament. At this point in the scripture, this delivers the first seed planted of the development into a theology of an earthly person versus a saint. Of a godless person versus a godly person. Of a carnal-minded person versus a heavenly-minded person. Of a lost person versus a saved person. The Nephilim were wicked and they were lost. Picking up verse 5. 
Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from the anim man uh, to animals, to creeping things, and to the birds. By the way, that word birds is not the right word that's actually the it's flying there the flying animals okay of the, the flying of the sky for I am sorry that I have made them let's talk about the word sorry uh, we think of the word sorry as we, we maybe God made a mistake in what he did he wished he hadn't have done that but that's not what the word means the word means to self-control console yourself to console yourself the Lord consoles himself of the grief the pain that he has for what has become on earth which by the way was all part of God's plan God knew it was going to happen. Nothing is unknown to God. God knows this is what's going to happen because there's an important thing. The important thing that is a seed that is fiction to be placed that is going to be spun out through the rest of the entire Bible is the redemption of a person and his family because they are righteous. And we can't get to redemption without going through the Lord punishing a whole bunch of folks and leaving the righteous and the blameless untattered by the destruction. That's how we get to the, the, the theme of redemption. He is going to redeem Noah through the sin, through the flood, to get him on the other side. And we'll deal with that when we get on the other side of the flood. That's the reason for what's going on. The Lord knows what's going on. And he consoles himself because things have gotten so bad. It is such a bad place that it's not even safe for Noah or any of his family. Verse 8. But Noah found favor, that's the word grace, in the eyes of the Lord. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. How do you walk with God? How did Noah walk with God? The same way we walk with God. We talk to him. He talks to us. We listen to him. He listens to us. Nothing has changed. Noah walked with God like these other guys walked with God. Uh, Enoch, who only lived uh, till the year 982 after the creation of Adam. He lived 360 years. He walked with God and he was not. He did not have to go through death, the Bible tells us. In that lesson last week that we went through, Enoch was taken by God. Taken by God, so he did not have to pass through death. Here, here. Noah was in a relationship and he's walking with God. He is righteous. He is blameless. He's true to the Lord. and The Lord keeps him. Verse 11 says, Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Back in verse 5, he calls it wicked and evil. Now he calls it corrupt and violent. Corrupt. Take a slab of meat, go lay it out in your driveway for four days, and go pick it up, and what do you have? Corrupt. It has gone to ruin. That's what the word corrupt means. It's gone to ruin. Violent means, in the scripture, that people are killing each other. They are bringing harm and damage to each other. That's what's occurring in this time before the flood. And so it's not a safe place to live for anyone, especially not for Noah and for his family. Verse 13, then God said to Noah, you know, the Lord has to lay this out in some ways. He's given the instruction. I'm going to destroy all this. Oh, yeah, but Noah, I'm going to keep you. But let me know, let me tell you why I'm going to destroy everything else. And then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence because of them, and behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Now remember, about in God's time, we catch the thought later on. A day to the Lord is as a thousand. Okay, so he's coming in just a couple of minutes on God's time, but it's 120 years on our time. You follow me? Okay. He says, make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. I love this, gopher wood. gopher wood. Gopher is cypress wood, okay? Wood here, it's not just wood. This, this actually, the English translation said squared wood, okay? Squared. In other words, chop down the tree and plane it on four sides. Four sides. 
make it four sides. I've got a 12 by 12 inch example up there, planed on four sides. So it says, take cypress wood and square it on four sides. And you shall make the ark with rooms. How many rooms? He doesn't tell him. You just make it up, Noah. I'm telling you to make it with rooms. And you shall cover it inside and out with pitch. That's tar. Tar is a product of oil. For those of you who believe that oil was created by decomposing animals over billions and billions and billions of years, we're only 1,650 years, oh, 16, oh, 1,530 years into creation since Adam. I don't think that many animals decomposed and turned to tar in that length of time. I'm just a thought. It's just a thought, okay? Here we go. Tar, inside and out. If you see any example of an ark that is built today that is not covered with black tar inside and out, it is not accurate. Because it was covered with tar. Oh, I love this. Fun facts. And this is how you shall make it. And folks, this is all we know about the design of the ark. We know nothing else than what I'm fixing to tell you about the design of an ark. Most arks that we see look like boats of today. They've got a keel. They've got a bow. They've got some sort of rudder. That's only good if you're in a powered uh, vessel. Now, this ark is going to be larger than our children's building. Noah and his three boys and the wives don't have enough power to row that boat anywhere or to steer it anywhere at all. It is a huge, this is a huge barge. Here we go. And this is how you are to make it. The length of the ark is 300 cubics. That's 450 feet. I got it drawn up there for you. 450 feet. The width is 50 cubics. That's 75 feet. The height is 30 cubics. That's 45 feet. You shall make a window for the ark. Does it tell us where to put it? And finish it to a cubic from the top. So, that's interesting. And set the door of the ark in the side of it. Doesn't tell us which side, just one door. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. That's all we know about the ark. All we know, I've got it drawn for you. It was 450 feet long. It was 75 feet wide. It was 45 feet high. It had three decks. We had a bottom deck. We had another deck and another deck. We have a roof on it. I've actually got a little pitch on this roof, but probably it was just flat. Just flat. They were to tar this vessel with tar from the tar pits up to within 21 inches from that top of that roof. And so there was a, a water line there of fresh wood uh, all the way around. Okay. Now, <clears throat> has one door, but we don't know which side. I don't know why he would put a door right in the middle of this. But it doesn't matter whether he knew anything about it or not. He didn't know whether this thing would float or not. He wasn't exactly sure what was going to happen. He was just told to build an ark. Did the Lord tell him yet it was going to flood? Is it going to rain? No, he's out there on the, on the sands of whatever with cypress trees all around him or on the land and building, cutting down cypress trees to build this thing. He puts a door where he wishes. It doesn't matter. God's going to close it. He's going to seal it. He puts a window in. We don't know where that is either. He covers it with tar within this inside and out, and it's all covered with rooms. So I just did some speculation for you. Just some speculation. We don't know this to be fact, but today's just fun facts just in case it was. You ready for this, Brother Hogg? Just fun facts. If, actually I've got the recorder on, if he built the, this ark out of 12 by 12 logs that were 20 foot long, 12 inches by 12 inches by 20 foot long, and they're planed on both sides. So two sides, two, uh, two logs can marry together perfectly, okay? If that happened... I've already figured out what it, what it would take to build this. Not hard. Just a few little calculations. It took 12,066 logs, 20 foot long, to build this. That's with the middle deck, the bottom floor, the top deck, the roof, all the supports inside, and enough lumber to put to build 12 foot by 12 foot rooms scattered all the way through this arc. Okay? 
That is 2,954,913 board feet. That is a lot of, that is a lot of, lot of board feet. The ark weighed, because we know what Cyprus weighs, five, if this is true, approximately 5,909,625 pounds. Let's say that we added 1 million pounds of animals. 1 million pounds. That brings the ark to 6,909,625. Okay, we do a few little calculations on that. So, okay, how high is the water going to rise up on that, on that um, ark? It's really easy. Salt water, one cubic foot, 12 inch by 12 inch by 12 inches of water, of salt water, is average 64.1 pounds per cubic foot of water. So we figure out, we've got the 6 million weight here. We just divide that by 64.1, and it, dis it displaces 33,750 cubic feet of water sitting in it. Which, what does that mean? That means this arc, the draft, how, draft means how much of the boat is underneath the water. The water line is at 3.19 feet. 3.19 feet. That's how far down in the water the boat sits, the arc sits. Now let's just say they filled up that ark to where the water line went to within four inches of where the tar went to. you got to have a little bit so it doesn't seep in, a little tar. Within four inches. I've already done that calculation too. That means this ark is going to sit in the water to right there, 43 feet, 43 feet of that ark down below the water. That ark could carry 98 million pounds of animal and feed inside of it 98 million probably it's closer to a million probably closer to a million that's probably it. fun facts we don't know those to be true but it's just fun let's go on and behold he says to uh, Noah I even I am bringing the flood of water upon the earth oh now he knows what's going on to destroy all flesh in which the breath of life from under the heavens everything that is on the earth shall perish well, it's kind of interesting because he's already told us what's going to destroy. Later, he's going to tell us what he's going to destroy again. And it happens to be the animals. That's the cows, the hippopotamus, all those land animals that breathe air, all the flying creatures, and all of the reptiles. He's going to destroy all those, but he's not going to destroy the, the sea animals, the water animals. He's not going to destroy all the plants. They're going to make it through. The plants and everything are going to make it through. Verse 18 says, But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife, and your son's wives with you. The sons aren't even born yet. And the wives are not even born yet. But he's establishing a covenant. And the word covenant here means to pure or to cleanse. To purify or to cleanse. In other words, he's making a promise to Noah that though his sins be as scarlet, According to the judgment that's about to come, his sins are as pure and as clean and as white as snow. You see, that's the development of the theology that's being laid out in a seed being planted right here. Noah, sons can't hear it yet. Maybe the wife hears it. Noah, because they're not born. Noah, you're going to be pure and clean in my eyes and I'm going to carry you through this and you're going to survive. You're going to be saved from the floods that are about to come that's the first covenant covenant that he makes with noah the second covenant he makes with noah there are two noahic covenants it's going to he's promise he's going to promise noah and his sons that never again will the earth be destroyed by water and he's going to put a rainbow in the sky that's in next week's lesson let's don't dwell on it here every thi living thing he look here he's going to say this verse 19 and of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring them two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, ish and isha. Of the birds, that's actually of the flying after their kind, of the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing, that's reptiles after their kind, of the ground after its kind. Two of every kind shall come to you to keep them alive. The Lord has to tell Noah the reason this ark has got to be the size it's going to be because he has got a major task. He's going to keep them alive. Verse 21. And as for you, Noah, i got one more job for you. Take for yourself some of all food which is edible and gather it to yourself and it shall be food for you and for them. 
them. Who did we just them about in the last passage? Everything that flies, everything that creeps, and everything that walks. He's going to have to feed the animal. This ark is going to have more than just animals in it. It's going to have food to feed them through the entire time. Verse 22 says this, Thus Noah did, according to all God had commanded him, so he did. Noah is 480 years old when he hears this passage. His first son's going to be born when he's 500. That's Japheth. Yes, sir? What's your speculation on how Noah accomplished this I have no idea. In fact, since you brought that up, let me finish the lesson with the last paragraph because that's where I was headed, and thank you for the question. The question was, what was his speculation? Well, let me do speculate something for you before I get there. It's in the lesson but I haven't told you this. Noah has 120 years left. Take out the Sabbaths because he is going to rest on the Sabbath. You got that? He has got to drop 12,066 trees and he's got to plane them on four sides. That means just speculation. How many trees does he have to drop and plane on four sides per day? I figure the number. Three and a half logs. He only has to do three and a half logs per day, not including the Sabbath. Nothing on the Sabbath, just three and a half trees, at least 20 foot long, that give him a 12 by 12, or a 10 by 10. Or an 8 by 8 or whatever it was. That's all it was. By the way, you realize if it's a 10 by 10, this thing's floating a little higher. If it's an 8 by 8, it's floating a little higher than that. If it's a 6 by 6, it's barely sitting in the water about 4 and a half or 5 inches. Okay? If it's, if it's 20 by 20s, the ark's going to be sitting down lower because it's got more weight. But he only had to drop 3 and a half to 4 trees per day on average and plane them side by side. And if you don't think that can happen, I got news for you. That old axe that they take that the bends down like this and sharp across the bottom, you get that log down there and you just start doing it like this and it moves real fast. It moves faster than you would think. Not as fast as a chainsaw, but awfully fast. So we've got some other speculations. The last pa passage, the last uh, paragraph in our lesson says this. What do we know about the distractions that Noah had to deal with during his ark building years? Distractions. We don't know anything. Did he do it alone? Did he hire help? How many trees could he cut each day? How many trees could he plane each day? How many wood pegs did he have to carve for the project? I mean, they didn't have nails and screws. Were the pegs square? Were they round? How did he cut the holes for the pegs? How did he join the corners together? How was the floor supported? How were the inner walls attached to the outer walls to give it strength and to the floor? How many rooms were on each level? How was the roof attached? Were all the timbers basically the same size? Only the Lord knows. Questions. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time to worship you and to study your scripture. In your name, amen and amen.